Well, welcome everyone to CG webinar number 337. And it's good to see lots of people coming in now to this popular topic, tracking graduate skills demand. Golo Hinseki uh, will lead us through those issues. And um, I'll introduce Golo in a moment, but let's begin with the webinar protocols as usual. At this point, it's a delight to introduce my colleague researcher in the Center for Global Higher Education, Golo Hinseki. He works as an associate professor at the Institute of Education at, in the UCL. Uh, that's the UCL's Faculty of, um, of Education, much larger than faculties of education at other universities. Um, he's uh, got a multidisciplinary social science background. His major is in economics. Before joining the Center for Research on Learning and Life Chances at IOE in 2014 as a research officer, he worked as a research assistant and teaching fellow in Germany. And um, he's been associated with the CG research program since 2016. He's got a range of interests that cut across multiple themes in labor and education economics. Amongst other things, he's examined patterns and determinants of heterogeneity in graduate outcomes in the labor market and beyond examined the role of school quality on job outcomes and analyzed the transition to work during times of heightened uncertainties as we certainly are now experiencing. Golo, the screen is now yours. Thank you so much, Simon. Um, the first challenge is going to be to share my screen. Um, just give me a moment. Yes, we can see that, Golo. Okay, that's fantastic. I'm just switching to... Okay, great. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about tracking graduate skills demand, more specifically tracking graduate skills demand in Britain. This is ongoing work at the Center for Global Higher Education. And this particular strand, we aim to better understand the often varied graduate labor market outcomes through a um, economic demand side perspective. The project's overall aims are to understand better how employers deploy, draw, and value graduate skills. And in this presentation, I'm going to discuss um, I'm going to discuss shifts in graduate skills use over time, the contribution of higher education expansion itself on the use of graduate skills in the British economy and the price employees are willing to use, to pay to use graduate skills. So stay tuned. This is all coming um, in the next half an hour or so. So, oh, sorry. The, there's a vast literature on graduate labor market outcomes. Um, and the backdrop is, of course, clear is the massification of higher education. The British workforce has never been better educated. Um, graduate attainment in 2020 was about 35% in the age group 20 to 60 years, up from 13% in 1995. And there have been countless studies examining individual, individual level correlates or predictors of graduate wages and increasingly gradual, with increasing granularity. Um, we know a great deal of what program characteristics or what programs, what individual characteristics predict um, later life earnings. While important for our understanding of the great variation in the monetary returns to higher education, these studies do not illuminate the potential role of job content for the observed returns. But to become productive, employers need to make use of graduate skills. So now that's the gap sort of that we are trying to fill here. There is, of course, research done on this. And most of this research looks at trends in the graduate wage premium. There's been a recent paper on that. Um, and usually in Britain, at least, this has been remarkably stable. There's been really, very little change in the graduate pay premium. And I'm going to show you a picture that confirms that, basically. On the other hand, there's been research on graduate under underemployment, so on graduates not in graduate jobs and rising pay um, differentiation. And here's just a few references to this. And this, uh, and this type of 
two strands of research come to kind of different conclusions. On one hand, we have a stable pay premium. On the other hand, we see an increasing share of graduates in non-graduate employment and a greater diverse differentiation of graduate pay um, up, to a um, up to the recent past. So then if everyone looks at wages, let's have start off with a look at wages um, and inquire a little bit why this might not be fully satisfying. Looking at the wage trends in the UK since the mid 1990s, this both these, what they, both these pictures do for graduates and non-graduates. You can see that initially the increase, increase in attainment was closely matched by an increase in average graduate as well as non-graduate wages until about 2007. Um, at about the time of the Great Recession, graduate and non-graduate wages fell and more or less stagnated since with a slight recovery um, between 2015 and 2020, but um, only, only slight. And who knows um, if we were to look at more recent data, how that looked like since this is um, inflation adjusted. Throughout this period, graduate and non-graduate wages followed very similar patterns apparently tracking some macroeconomic development rather than the expansion of the higher education of higher education and attainment in the workforce itself. For both groups, uh, we have discussed the trends. Um, the result is that the pay premium indeed was mostly stable over this period with some fluctuations and maybe some slight downward trend towards the end, but overall it's a picture of great stability. The rapid transformation from an elite system to a mass higher education system has thus not depressed the pay premium, nor is there any apparent relationship between the higher education expansion and the wage trends. And this picture of Britain's graduate labor market has led, um, sorry, this picture of, of Britain's graduate labor market has led to contrasting interpretations. This stable pay premium is often given as evidence of a labor market in relatively good health. However, the sharp drop in graduate and non-graduate wages after 2007-8 challenges this interpretation quite obviously. The problem is that by looking just at wages, um, we can't really interrogate what's behind it. What are the driving factors for this wage dynamics and the stable pay premium. And this talk, the underlying paper, and have been writing up for years, we're attempting to revisit this um, through the lens of graduate skill use. So these are the objectives that I'm going, that I'm trying to cover in the next, um, well, now about 20 minutes. I want to measure and track graduate skill use in the British economy since 1997, assess the impact of the HE expansion on graduate skill use in the British labor market, estimate the, and estimate finally the price British employers are willing to pay to use graduate skills. And a lot of this work actually draws on existing stuff. And particularly, I want to highlight work that Jeff Mason um, who died after long illness in 2020 has done in this area. Very early on, after just the init initial expansion of higher education, Jeff examined graduate recruitment and deployment in detailed studies of British industry. Two papers, one in 1996 and 2002. So they, these two papers really afford us an excellent view of what happened early on in this transformation of the um, economy and the world of work in response to the higher, edu to higher education expansion. Among other things, these studies ask and answer to what extent the substitution, substitution of non-graduates graduates was associated with potentially productivity enhancing developments such as job enrichment and a higher quality of work performance. And that's basically, and that's the key question that I'm also going to ask, ask using quantitative data though. In this 1996 paper, so that's just a few years after the um, higher education expansion really kicked off in Britain. 
Jeff criticized the often static conceptualization of the nature of graduate level work, and this applies still today. Um, it often it does ignores job enrichment and contradicts and and also contradicts the implicit assumption still hold how today as well that growing graduate numbers will enhance industrial performance through job enrichment through greater skills use. In the case studies he conducted, he found that indeed technological change and intensified competition increased, genuinely increased graduate demand. Graduates were valued for their problem solving adaptability, specialist knowledge and interpersonal skills. So all this generic skill stuff that you can find elsewhere in the literature. Um, and to utilize graduate skills, employers reorganized old high level jobs and created new high level jobs, non-routine work. Um, However, there was also an increasing differentiation of entry routes. Some graduates were recruited into otherwise unchanged routine jobs. Nonetheless, overall, up to this point, a fairly um, positive story with some caveats. Uh, finally, maybe as well to mention is that employers were willing to pay higher wages for those enriched jobs. In this follow-up study in 2002, um, in three industries this time, the story became a little bit more nuanced. Um, on one hand, graduate, the growing graduate supply was partially met by increasing demand for graduate level skills and specialist knowledge. However, there was also this growth in um, graduates entering less demanding jobs. For this was not the, necessarily the end because job enrichment can still happen. Um, the job enrichment occurred through Firstly, a permanent upgrading of previously clerical or administrative jobs, or secondly, a more temporary molding of jobs towards individual skill sets, where an individual graduate would take on um, additional responsibilities, duties, um, and tasks to um, yeah, well, fit mold the job towards their skill set. The main drivers for this permanent upgrading were the same stuff as before, technological change, organizational change, um, intensified comp com competition, and as well, maybe interesting, more complex more bureaucracy, basically. Um, nonetheless, he concludes that there are limits to job enrichment without the external drivers for high skill demand. And that brings me to my sort of framework, what, how, how we are going to approach this um, issue and that's through what's called the task approach. In this task approach, jobs are conceived as bundles of tasks. A task is a unit of a sort of as a unit of work activity that produces some output. That's that's on the job side, on the worker side we've got skills. It's a worker's endowment of capabilities for per, for, for ver, performing various tasks. Individual skill determines how many tasks a worker can carry out and employers pay for task delivery. This now intersects with um, the computerization, with technological and organizational change driven by digital technologies. Digital technologies take over job tasks that can be made sufficiently routine for automation. On one hand, on the other hand, digital technologies complement high skill usually university educated, educated workers in carrying out problem solving and complex communication activities. And to illustrate this, I have um, created um, a follow up pictures to Bruce Chapman's kittens. If you have ever seen Bruce Chapman's talk about loan in, income contingent loans, there are his income contingent kittens. And now we have the grown up versions of them working very hard in their graduate job as slick um, and smart graduates presenting their analytical findings, convincing their big cat, the big boss cat um, to improve product productivity processes and so forth. You can imagine that computerization greatly helped them do all this fantastic work they are doing at their, at their job. So the predictions then more specifically from the um, task approach are that Digitalization shifted task profiles towards cognitive and interpersonal activities, thus driving up skills 
requirement. Digitalization also enabled graduates to become more productive across a wider range of jobs, including in previously non-graduate jobs. So this would be the um, clerical and um, administrative positions Jeff mentioned um, that would be upgraded because well, now you can do more with computers sitting there and connected to the internet and so forth. Um, as a result, the demand and thus pay for university educated workers rose in relative and absolute terms. And finally, in the absence of task bias technological change, graduates extend the range of tasks, i.e. they move still into non-graduate jobs, but with downward pressure on graduate pay and the pay of others, because they would then done this cascading process. Um, they move into non-graduate jobs, those workers that were there before would have to move further down the job ladder. This is all drawing on stuff that I've worked on before, um, strategically with Francis um, Green, going on since the start of CG really. Um, we use this approach to analyze graduate outcomes in Britain and elsewhere. One of the more or one of the interesting findings from that um, research we've done during the first round of CG was the relationship between um, the higher characteristics of the higher education system at graduate skills use. For example, in this picture, I don't want to go to, into too much detail here, we do find that um, the relative skill advantage of graduates, so the more skilled relative graduates are relative to um, the next best group, um, that would be usually tertiary or sub-tertiary um, um, post-secondary education, uh, educational levels of educational attainment, the larger the skills gap was the higher the demand for graduate skills in the economy. Same, we found a negative relationship between the dropout rate from higher education and this um, graduate skills use. So there was some evidence, basically what I wanted to say was some evidence that the quality of the higher education system itself was related to the graduate, graduate skills use. And while I'm not going to talk, look at the international pictures in the following, we take one country, the UK, and look at what happened over the long term. So the data set that I'm going to draw on is um, the Skills and Employment Service series. It started back in 1986 and since 1997, so fairly early on, um, from after the start of the massification in Britain, um, especially then spilling over into the labor force, SES has measured the importance of more than 30 job tasks alongside information on educational requirements, work organization and tools using the job requirements approach. All surveys in this series are high quality random probability surveys and I'm specifically focusing my analysis um, on 20 to 60 year olds. The center variables that I'm going to look at are degree requirements. So we asked all the workers if they were applying today, what qualification, if any, would someone need to get the job you've now? Um, I'm looking at master's or PhD in university or CNA degree, CNAA are the poly, the former polytech degrees in Britain. What I like about this question is that it leaves open why an employer or why a degree would be needed. Is it, it could be because a degree certifies certain skills that are valued. It could signal abilities that graduates um, gained through other means than higher education. Or it could be, it's, it's, it could signal some kind of credential and um, some belonging to a certain group, some um, something beyond productivity. Then we look at the job skills that I've already mentioned, sort of 30 job tasks covering a whole range of um, domains. And finally, we have hourly pay, um, pre-tax, labor earnings and income from self-employed, and that's then converted into an hourly rate um, using typical hours of work um, on, of course, inflation adjusted. So just to give you an impression of how we sort of thought about graduate skills use and how we got everything into one index, we look basically at all these um, different domains 
and then combined the task measures into an index of graduate skills which as the predictive probability that a job requires degree qualification given the task profile. So that was our way of combining them into one index. There are certainly other ways, but um, this one works for us. And I'm going to show you that it produces quite interesting results. Uh, talking of plausibility and valid, valid, validity um, of our index. So that's actually what I'm going to talk about right now. So across occupation, graduate skill use was highest for corporate managers and senior officials, legal professionals and research professionals. So right at the top of the, the, the top three um, major occupation groups. And they are usually summed up under high skills, under high skill um, jobs. So this is a, a clear relationship between our graduate skill use measure and what those people who designed the official occupation classification thought as high skill um, jobs. We also correlated our graduate skills use index with wages, um, with graduate wages and graduate self-reported skills utilization and found that the skills use index clearly predicted wages and skills utilization um, over and above the simple index, whether it's whether a degree is required or not. So then moving on, so after setting all the scenes, after all the scene setting, let's move on to actually some of the research findings. So first we were interested how graduate skills use developed vis-a-vis um, -vis degree requirements. And you can see that in this chart. On the left-hand side are the degree requirements plotted. And on the right-hand side is the graduate skill use index over time. As you can see in this chart, up to, to about 2006, um, change in the left and right hand side more or less overlap. This suggests that there was a task warranted expansion of degree requirements. Basically, degrees rose um, along, degree requirements rose alongside changes in um, the way work was carried out How, from, from 1997 to 2006. However, around 2006, 2012, rising degree requirements decoupled from changes in job conditions. You see the huge change in degree requirements with very little change in graduate skills use. It is possible that they've re realigned again um, after 2012, but the evidence on that is a bit weak. Can't be, con can't be um, can't fully confirmed that. Beside the um, change overall, it's also interesting to look at what point in the um, job skill ladder those graduate skills use expanded. To get a look at this, I've broken the sample down into octiles of the graduate job skill distribution. In other words, I created an occupation hierarchy from low level to high level work. Um, you see that ranked here in this chart. And then I looked at within each segment how graduate skill use rose over time. This chart displays the two change the two changes over two dec over to the two decades, 1997 to 2006 and 2006 and 2017. The theory of task bias technological change would predict that graduate skills demand was particularly at the top and high level work. And we indeed find that for the first decade, this hold. However, compared with this first decade, there has been a slowdown in the expansion of graduate skills use with a relative largest drop um, at the top end of the distribution. It's clear uh, something has happened uh, between these two periods. Something broke. And we get back to that. Um, Next, we examined more, we were more, we were interested how workers' human capital, in other words, their education and attainment mapped to graduate skills use. We find graduate skills use systematically varied with indicators of workers' human capital. Each step up the qualification ladder, particularly from secondary to tertiary education, was associated with a large and highly significant difference in expected um, graduate skill use. 
which seems plausible. If you're measuring graduate skills, you would expect that graduates actually, um, uh, sorry, graduate skills use, you would expect that graduates are the one other group that um, is particularly good at it. Most, so and that's what you basically can see here. Most importantly, perhaps, is that despite the rapid expansion of higher education and all these changes that we talked about, the effects from past by technological change, the average level of graduate skill use by education level remained remarkably stable in the two decades. There has been some up and downs and some, um, some wobble here and some wobble there, but overall, none of this, um, at least on the data I've got, um, reaches any level of statistical significance. None of it, um, I, can, I can't be certain that it just wobble in the data. Um, so in other words, there's no evidence, no strong evidence that the mapping of educational levels to graduate skill use levels has changed. Looking, so looking at this metric, the typical graduate has not moved down the job skills ladder. Given this close relationship between education and skills use and the stability of the relationship, particularly, did graduate skills supply then actually create its own demand in line with what early proponents of higher education expansion were suggesting? To test this potential effect, I projected how much low to high level job skills sections would have risen from the higher education expansion alone if new graduates entered each segment at a fixed rate. And this is a rather mechanical index, but it, if that mechanical index predicts the observed increase in graduate skills use, we can conclude the expansion of higher education was behind it. And this rests on the assumption that the higher education expansion itself was largely exogenous, something that um, Simon Marchinson has written about um, that was basically driven by, um, driven by non-market forces. We find, doing that, we find that there was a close relationship between the projected change in high level work due to the expansion of higher education and the observed increase in graduate skills use. In all, the expansion of higher education of higher education attainment in the UK workforce explained nearly 50% of the observed increase in graduate skills use. So this, we talked between 1997 and 2007. So that's sort of the school society argument. Um, actually, I, there is a transformation happening here due to higher education expansion. However, and that's, and that's a very in, interesting finding, the impact of the continued higher education expansion on the growth of graduate skill use dropped to near zero after 2006. And that's the thing that broke that we saw earlier. Meanwhile, the degree requirements continue to ratchet up due to higher education expansion with an unbroken trend over um, these two decades. So what that means is basically we've got that in more recent years, um, employers continue to substitute graduates or non-graduates for graduates, but there is not this change in what those people do going on anymore. So as there's, there's, at least as far as we can observe, we don't see any change in the job task purpose, no job enrichment um, anymore after the, or since the Great Recession. It is, however, conceivable that our measure of graduate skills use is not particularly good. Um, that maybe we leave out something important or there's some tasks that have become more important over time. And to look at that a little bit more, looking at wages, and that's the last bit, um, the last few slides. Um, For this, I again collapse the data into job skill age. I collapse the data into job skill age region cells by survey by survey year when I sorted these cells into by the graduate skills use and plotted the wages against um, against those graduate skills use figures. I obtained the chart that you see in this slide. 
So there was a very close relationship between graduate skills use and pay. Um, jobs where graduate skills use were highest tended also to be the ones with the highest hourly pay. Doing a little bit more um, advanced statistical analysis on the data, we found that a five point increase in graduate skills use was predicted to raise hourly wages by 7.2%. Given the difference in graduate skills used, as we saw earlier, between school leavers and graduates, the estimated task price, this figure up in the first line, explains about 80% of the UK wage premium. So, in other words, the pay difference that we see is indeed mostly down to differences in graduate skills use. Interestingly, degree requirements themselves, so the stuff that still keeps growing, did not affect pay or over and above skills use. Graduate skills use retained its high wage premium throughout the period with no change. The wage premium was furthermore similar across the job skill distribution. In other words, incre just increasing graduate skills use a little bit, um, some even further down at the um, job hierarchy, increased wages, independently of whether you're a graduate or not. Graduate so bring this all together, graduate skills use rose since 1997, but there was a slowdown after 2006. Degree requirements continue to increase. Graduate skill use rose with the inflow of graduates. However, around the Great Recession, there was a decoupling of the graduate supply from jobs, from jobs, from increasing job skills coinciding with a weakening relationship with graduate skills use and degree requirements. Um, 80% of the graduate wage premium are down to job skills, wage returns were stable, and paper requirements did not affect wages. And then I have some discussion, but maybe we can leave that um, and we can move to the to the chat um, or to the post-presentation um, mode right now. Well, thanks, Golo. There's a lot there um, to think about and I hope that our, our large um, participant audience is thinking about its questions um, because we need some questions in the chat, but let me start the discussion. Uh, we've all known for a while that um, qualifications perform multiple roles. You know, they're not, you know, only one of their roles is the signal skills and, and they are a con convenient device for sorting pools of uh, applicants for jobs and um, regardless of whether they're the particular training is going to be used appropriately in, in the in, for the particular job but i just wondered if you haven't put your finger on the explanation here for the slow growth of productivity in the uk which is perhaps the central macroeconomic concern of um of many economists um who focus on policy issues because here we have a combination of things which would would on the face of it, explain productivity slowdown. You've got wages to graduates staying up, you've got graduate numbers expanding, and you've got the use of graduate skills not going up at the same rate as the expansion in the graduate labour market. That would seem to suggest that the, um, uh, you know, the the uh, remuneration going to graduates is not rewarding productivity. Um, in the same proportion as before. Yeah, I've thought about um, the, this. Is 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 it is tied in. I, I, yes. So I absolutely agree uh, with you, Simon, on that point. It's it, it seems tied in with the um, productivity malaise in the UK, whether as a whether as a symptom or as a, as 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 one of the causes is um, is. It's unclear, but yeah, there's yeah. something. Yeah, it, yeah, as you say, it may just represent the problem rather than explain it. But uh, that's an important uh, dimension of the argument. Yeah, and I don't think has been looked has been looked at um, previously this um, relationship with skills use and the and the lack of it since the um, Great Recession. Now I've got two more two more thoughts and questions. Um, one is that. Um, I mean, can we do you have data on trends in particular um, industries or, or for particular qualifications? Because they might try to start to unpack this difference between the two periods, which 
is so striking. Uh, maybe it varies a bit by industry or it varies according to the qualifications we're talking about. Mm, not for this piece. We did, um, we did, it has been, we have, we have done, I mean, this research, this, this, this particular paper I've been pushing around for years. Um, so it's been, it's, it, it's very slow cooking. It's a very, it's a very slowly cooked um, stew here. Um, the, so there, we have in the past had one breakdown by industry. And if I co recall correctly, there were differences between the public and private sector in, right. um, in, in this. They were particularly, um, it's surprisingly, or maybe surprisingly, um, um, if I recall, if I recall um, that the private sector struggled more recently um, to make use of the skills. The, um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the thing that broke. You know this, that you've referred to a couple of times um i mean you must have thought about this and and you know i realize it's this is getting us into speculation here and there's a larger kind of set of contextual and uh factors that work than than you know that are encompassed by the data that you're working with which makes it complicated but um what do you think is is the thing that changed i mean that's the recession good, might yeah, have been bigger that's a good question and um, there's been there's other work currently currently out and um one ex one explanation they pro one explanation there is that the quality of graduates has declined, um, so they come just simply they're less good. Um, I'm not particularly keen on that that paper because what they what they what they what or what they show is um, that graduates have become relatively smaller um, compared with the rest of the population, and then conclude from that, well they're smaller now they're so little little less smart. Um, I mean, of course, it's, it's not it's not entirely it's not entirely um, it's not it's not entirely implausible that that that, that story holds. So quality can could have there could have could be issues with credit quality. There could be issues with matching, and somehow that somehow um, graduate skills aren't going to the jobs where they are needed. Um, so these are the two things I'm currently thinking of. Uh, potential potential explanations for 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 the breakdown. It's it's not quite clear why all of us because the decline in quality would probably be a continuous decline rather than an abrupt shock decline in quality. Um, the matching maybe more maybe that's more pos possible that to think that um, the post the 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 um, decline in decline in wages that we saw and um, that didn't hit all the wages, all all wages, or all occupations the same degree after the Great Recession. So that maybe the incentives have changed and people are are gunning for jobs and sectors that are well paid, but maybe not um, particularly great in 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 making use of graduate skills so productively. That's what I was going to ask you about next. That is the um. I mean, are we also looking at changes in the way that graduates are used or or not, or, or, or rather a, a failure to change the workplace organisation sufficiently to make good use of the increased number of graduates coming through with skills or something like that? So there's, there's this sort of supply side and there's a demand side, isn't there? And there's, um, you know, that presumably you can't keep throwing qualified people onto the labour market and expect their skills to be used the same way as their predecessors. You know that there needs to be a production process which can utilize those skills hmm. yes Go on. that would be you would um it's still it's it's still it's the contrast between it's a what is staggering is me not staggering but it's too strong a word but what it's on one hand the the employers are clearly still willing to pay for those graduate yes skills um, but somehow not expanding, not expanding their use or struggling to find um, good, good, find, find 
the high level use for um, the new come, in, incoming graduates. So there's something sticky about wages here that mm. you know wage levels are not determined simply by the productivity of, of employees or um, but they are partly fixed by non-economic factors, maybe social, political factors. Sustain but, uh, that, but then I could, you, that, yeah, that's an interesting, that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Um, I, it's, it's then interesting that it's the skills use rather than the paper requirements that um, determine wages. I would expect if it were non-economic, non-productivity factors, I would have expected it to come through the degree, so the, the degree requirements, but they didn't pay anything. And that's, yes, I said, as a top point here on the discussion, this observation that in the UK labor market, paper qualifications are actually not particularly important in the recruitment process and so forth is that's, that's merit elsewhere. Now, another question is, is about the comparative position. Do you see similar great change occurring towards the at the end of the 2000s in other countries, uh, in comparable countries in Europe, for example? Yeah, we, have, the same pattern? we have very little data so far um, on com, um, that allows us to do any of this comparison. We have carried out similar research in for Singapore um, for not quite the same time period, but 2006 to 2017. So that covered the slowdown that we see here in our in our data. Um, and in Singapore, that isn't that it wasn't the case. We didn't see that slowdown in the demand in the, in the graduate skills utilization at all. So it's not specific. It's, so that's one comparison we've done. Um, once the OECD's PX survey, the skills, the survey of adult skills is coming out in what, 2024. It would be possible to do um, a broader comparison across countries and see if the what's happening in the UK is unique to the UK labor market and situation that the UK is in with mm -hmm. Brexit and so forth. Um, and or whether it's a general trend. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be surprising, wouldn't it, if there was this dramatic shift in the UK and nothing happening elsewhere, uh, would, even if the UK's position is, as you say, specific in some respects. Um, obviously, we're undergoing a, a, a macroeconomic slowdown, which is probably unique in the EU. Um, but even so, the shift is really striking at, towards the end of the 2000s and before Brexit, of course, comes on the scene and, you know, well before, really. Um, well, we have a puzzle here, Golo, because nothing's yeah. appearing in the chat. Well, I hope, the right, I um, hope ESSC sees it the same way and um, pays for another round. Right. Um, I, I'm puzzled by why I'm not seeing any um, interventions in the chat. And that's most, I've never seen that before. And this is 337th mm. uh, webinar. Here we are, Christina Lima. Um, good on you, Christine, Christiane, Christiani. Um, can I bring you in at this point? Um, I'm going to invite you straight in uh, into the webinar and to put your question directly to Golo. Hello, hello. Hi. Here she is. Fire Thank away. you so much, Golo. Sorry, I'm just in a co-working space. Just um, So I work in higher education and I'm interested in researching about higher education. And I was just wondering um, what your perception is of um, low value courses and how does it link with your research? Um, I know there's great interest um, on this right now. Mm. It, it was one of the motivations to, to um, look at this, to look at this data. Because the argument is often brought, well, we look at um, or by by policymakers and um, administration that we look at wages, and then conclude from low wages. Well, this must have been a low quality course, um, and one of the aims was to interrogate that assumption. What is actually behind those potentially low wages? Well, um, if an all the the maybe a bit depressing news is. Um, 
is potentially skills use differences that could as good at least in the uk labor market it seems that wage differentials do reflect differences in in, in skills utilization um whether that done means that the higher education itself or whether higher education or something before higher education contributed made it hard for this graduate then to um find well-paid job work that utilizes skills um, is a different thing. The one thing, so maybe, so that's, 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 that's one point. The other point, and that's maybe more important, that is the long-term thing. Of course, when we don't have any growth in graduate skills use, it becomes more of a redistribution. So this, low, this, this argument of low value qualification only really applies because, well, if the that segment is not growing, growing in a productive way. There aren't really the, it, the only way for graduates from colleges and universities from lower and the packing order is to go into jobs that are more routine and less well paid. If we had more growth in graduate skills demand, um, that wouldn't be such a big deal. As my, as my feeling as speculation, but my feeling is this whole debate about, um, low value degrees is only a sign of um, the, the growing import, positional importance of higher education due to a lack of productivity growth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always a factor, isn't it? And but the balance between the two elements, productivity and uh, and signaling changes, doesn't it? No. Over, you know, particular circumstances. Um, now we've got more activity in the chat. Good to see Jocelyn. Uh, Jocelyn Krauss, you're next. Come in, please. Hello, thank you. Thank you for this. Um, so I put in the chat, I'm wondering about that blue fan visual. So forgive me if this is like very basic in your field, if I'm not aware of it, I was wondering of how you differentiated those different skills, because there's some terms in there that I was thinking like, oh, I wonder how they divided these as separate categories, um, which ones might, like, did you have debates about which might be subsets of other skills and then the difference between skills and like just character traits and general talents. Um, yeah. So you mentioned it a little bit, um, but I'm wondering if you can unpack it a little bit. Um, it may be very um, familiar to you, but new to me. So I'm very curious. Thanks. Um, yep. So you're absolutely right. And this, this skill, the, the word skill here is used in a very broad way in, 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 in the broadest, in the broadest way, actually. Um, it, it refers to not knowledge, tr more trades type of stuff, um, work organization, when it comes to task discretion and task variety and, and the use of tools. So I was, I was very vague on um, the term skill here. The, the paper when it comes out explains a little bit more. So in, in principle, I use this visualization only to show sort of the domains we cover or look at, consider as part of graduate skills use. Um, we use then we, we don't actually we don't actually group the individual items that 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 relate to this task we just use all these 30 variables and bunch them together so that's the Great. that's very helpful thank you thank yeah you. And, and i mean yeah i don't know um there are some interesting aspects um here that may be worth looking at in uh, that, that are worth highlighting, let's say. So for example, task discretion is something that is often taken as an indicator of, um, so that's job autonomy, so how much control someone has over their job, that's often taken as sort of a, a central measure of what graduates, what, of the, what is a graduate job. Um, then there's the computer use um, itself, which is of course growing throughout this period. It's very clear that it's a central, central um, driver of what's happening in terms of increasing skills use. I hope that explains a bit more. Thanks, Golo. Um, let's bring in Anand Chen at this point. And Anand, I think, is going to tell us that uh, things are not unique to the UK, but maybe happening in China as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, nice to meet you here, Golo. Um, yeah, actually, my question is kind of related to your previous discussion with Simon. Because um, you mentioned there is an interesting finding in this research um, that degree requirement is not related to the increase of um, skills utilization and also the uh, wage premium. And I think that happens um, in China, Chinese labor market as well, because 
Um, certainly, uh, degree qualifications are very important when uh, looking for jobs, um, but actually graduates are also struggling to decide which one is more important, either um, skill development or um, degree qualification. Um, so actually, I'm wondering um, about your opinion regarding this issue and also what can be the trends in the future regarding the relationship between degree and graduate labor market outcomes? Thank you. Thanks, Anan. Um, good to see you. The well, that's a that's a it's a good, very good question. Um, there's a lot to it's a, a, on many important points. I think what's important <laughs> um, to consider is that. It seems that I mean, and, and Simon and Simon said that as well. Um, degree qualification and skills use so degree degree qualifications for, for multiple multiple roles um, or education qualification for, for multiple roles. That's malleable. It might change um, in times. It, it it it's worth looking at the conditions under which they decouple and align with job skills use. Um, it seems that in times of economic um, uncertainty they are more loosely aligned when the labor market isn't isn't i mean well, it's actually not true the labor market is going very well in the uk so that can't be argued that there's no labor demand um so it's there are some quest, open questions under what conditions degree require or qualification requirements and um skills use are actually aligned and under which they aren't okay thank you now i'm um, we're running up towards the end of our time. So what I'll do now is bracket the next two questions. So Golo, hold your, your answer to the first question until you've heard the two questions and then tackle them together. Um, and there are two questions will come from Miguel Perez Milans and David Sweeney. So Miguel, can you, you uh, give us your question, please? Yeah, hi, hi, thanks. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, I was thinking, I mean, this is about connecting with something that you said uh, through the middle of your presentation. So as, as someone coming from, I'm a language and communication scholar, a discourse studies type of person. So, so um, rather than thinking about skills as something that can be measured uh, uh, in itself, I'm more interested in questions uh, uh, or connected to the performance of, you know, the performative dimension that you referred to, right? Like uh, skills can also be performed uh, and be, so, um, and I was thinking about, some of these categories that we hear about these uh, soft skills and hard skills and how sort of critical thinking sometimes uh, gets to be seen as in connection with soft skills. And so, but then it has to be performed in order to have value. But I wonder sort of uh, this multiplication of, of categories about the skills um, and how they performed, how they relate to, uh, I mean, we uh, university students are supposed to be seen as critical thinkers uh, that being a possible skill. But then I wonder, you know, um, the performance of that soft skill, for example, critical thinking, becoming a critical uh, uh, person, whether that has, I mean, how is that value or whether that has a real value uh, in the context that you are talking about uh, in the UK? Well, when you are hard and soft skills, Golo, but hold your answer. We'll bring in David Sweeney for the second question. So I think the government's argument is that although the labour market is strong, there's uh, there's insufficient supply of uh, STEM skills, basically, and that inhibits employers from moving into new areas. Uh, of course, I don't agree about the low value degrees, but uh, I understand the argument. I'm not sure this paper uh, validates the position uh, that increasing the stock of STEM skills will necessarily lead to those skills being deployed by employers, but I'm interested in comments. Hey, Gola, I've got two different questions then. Um, let's take David's question first. Um, mm -hmm. Indeed, it doesn't. Um, it, it doesn't. I don't think the composition of graduates has changed dramatically. Um, the percentage during STEM is probably pretty much stable. So there's, for in our very macro or macro view of um, what has changed, I don't I don't see any change. It would be an interesting question. Um, does the expansion and change in the number of STEM graduates um, does that actually do we see 
is that tied to an improvement in, in, in those skills that are typically related to um, STEM, numeracy, um, problem solving? Do we see that such an increase in the UK labour market um, or do we not? Um, so there's something maybe to be looked at. The um, soft hard and soft skill question and the and the value. Um, the, the, yeah, we um, um, indeed we we mix them all together here. And haven't really differentiated between hard and soft skills. Um, and value is measured. I mean, yeah, with with a very economics eye, economists eye on value and through through wages. Um, so it's limits. Um, yeah, that's our value judgment here are than how much employers pay. Is that answering your question, Miguel and David? Yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thank you. And uh, we're going to have to move to the close, I think, slightly earlier than usual. Um, but we are just a minute or so short of the hour. Um, Golo, I think that you've opened up a lot of questions there. Um, you've given us data which we can, um, you know, we can work with. I think that that dramatic shift is is really helpful to see. Um, and you've added fuel to the to the blazing argument about uh, the use of graduate skills and about the value of degrees without conclusively tying off the issue. Um, but what's your next step in this kind of inquiry? What do you want to know next that will help you explain this historical pattern? Tie it in more directly with, the, with productivity developments um, to, 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 to get that angle. We are also very pleased that the Skills and Employment Survey is um, going to be in the field again. It's got funding for another round so we can extend the time horizon and look um, at what has happened actually um, now post pandemic around the pandemic do we do we see in a continuation of previous trends or has have things re rekindled in a way um, do we see any long-term impact of brexit um, the pandemic itself on graduate skills utilization that sort of stuff um, okay. so there's great that's it's, it's fantastic um, we also maybe i can before we turn off, have a, we're also planning a um, little a little workshop. I'm um, asking some of the questions that we've um, talked about, particularly yes. the international the international comparative element. Um, and I, if you're in the audience, are working on similar topics. This is a pre-announcement call or pre-announcement that a call will be open at some point in the beginning of March through CG channels and SIHE channels for an in-person event in 11th, 12th of September, where you can um, submit an abstract where you are welcome. We look forward to seeing a lot of people doing research on this. Well, that so that's looks really kind of interesting. Yeah, I mean, 11th and 12th of September, post-summer. Uh, get down to business in the in the new academic year with uh, a good look at uh, questions about graduate outcomes and international perspectives as well as the national data so great uh, great opportunity i think to take the argument further um i'm um aware of the time again and i i should perhaps say that our next uh cg webinar number 337 is in fact is today, today was 336 um was is uh you are Baha Lucy talking about um, international education in Hong Kong, paradoxes of intercultural communication, adaptation and acculturation strategies. So very different shift, but in some ways the issues about graduate employment and employability still there, I think, in the discussion of intercultural communication in Hong Kong, which is a very graduate labour market aware place. So thanks, Golo, you're our expert um, and it's really valuable to have you on the uh, CG webinar programs and we hope we'll have you back uh, and we certainly look forward to this um, September event um, which will open up the questions in more detail. Thanks for today and goodbye, goodbye for now to everyone. Thank you.